All right, if you would, turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians. We're going to move on from our discussion of the book of Romans. So we spent quite a bit of time in the book of Romans, a little over a week, which is okay. I like to carve out a lot of time discussing Romans. Romans is, uh, if you want to kind of view it as the coat rack from which all of the other letters of Paul kind of hang on, that's not a bad analogy. I really do think that Romans is not only first in Paul's letter collection because it's one of the lengthiest letters, but it's also first in primary because I think it lays the foundation for so many other things that Paul comes back to and talks about. So with the Corinthian correspondence, we've got a couple of interesting things here. One is even though there is teaching in Paul's letters to 1 and 2 Corinthians, there's quite a bit of it. It is by no means a doctrinal letter like Romans was. I mean, Romans was split pretty nicely into, you know, teaching, doctrine, and then exhortation, application, practice. And we got to see how Paul's argument kind of built up to this idea of be unified, right? Remember the gray areas, these disputable matters, and how you and I are supposed to get along, even though we have varying opinions on some some things that are just not gospel-centric, right? So things that might be culturally uh, divisive. When we get to 1st and 2nd Corinthians, though, we see that one of the primary problems is Paul is talking about unity, or in this case, disunity. In other words, there was disunity in the churches in Corinth, and so he's writing to address these very uh, practical application uh, issues. So disunity, sexual immorality, Um, We see that Paul is talking about the use of gifts properly so that there's not a a disruptive worship service, but everything is done kind of with some order and some uniformity. And so all of these different issues are questions that actually Paul was asked to weigh in on. And so the Corinthian correspondence is very much about him answering questions. And of course, there's theology in there, but there's also this... um, This really lends to help us see into the early church and some of the issues that they were dealing with. Now, this same lens is very practical for today, right? We're going to see that very similar issues that Paul is bringing up in the Corinthian church and the solutions are are going on today in the modern church as well. So it's not like we have to kind of use our imagination too much in order to kind of step back into the ancient world. A lot of that is something that is very visible for us now. So the question before you and I is, how can you and I be good church members? And I want you to think in terms of that lens, like what does it mean to be good church members? How do we contribute to our church? Maybe I could fine tune the question a little bit more. What if your home church wrote to you and said, look, we have some problems with disunity. Here's the situation. How should we handle this? What would you say? Maybe your home church writes to you and And your pastoral staff, your elder board are like, hey, we've got this situation where there's some gross immorality. What are we supposed to be thinking here? How should we handle this? Kind of put yourself into into Paul's sandals a little bit. What kind of wisdom would you give them? Let's see what Paul has to say in regard to those topics. All right, so let's start with the background information. We have multiple authors here for each of these letters. So this is something new that we haven't had to really deal with. The assumption was that there was a single author for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even though they're predominantly anonymous, right? And for the book of Acts, we were able to really kind of zero in on Luke as our author because of some clues within the text. Romans, Paul says, hi, I'm Paul, and I'm writing to the Roman church. Very clear cut. But when we get to 1st and 2nd Corinthians, we see that there are multiple authors listed. So if you would, look in your Bible at 1st Corinthians 1.1. I just want to, I want to draw your attention to to this detail because it's going to be repeated in many of Paul's other letters. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. So in other words, in ancient letter writing uh, format, we would have the author or authors stating who they are up front, who they're writing to stated right up front. And then there would usually be some kind of greeting, like a well-wishing or a prayer or something like that. Paul usually develops this and puts quite a bit of theology in there. And then the kind of body of the letter, very similar to what we do today. So here we have Paul and Sosthenes really writing a group project, right? First Corinthians is a collaborative effort. They're both authors. And then for 2 Corinthians, we have Paul and Timothy. 
Now, it could be that Sosthenes is merely what we might call an amanuensis, a, a scribe who is taking the notes and writing it down. But I don't think that's what Paul is intending to communicate by attaching his name there. I think they're both authors, likewise with Timothy as well. In other words, they're both contributing. Yes? Is this the same Timothy that Paul writes to in first and second Timothy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Timothy, one of the kind of junior, junior members that Paul is training, and then, of course, he writes to him at the end, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, who's the audience? Well, once again, we have this clearly stated in the beginning. Paul is writing to churches in Corinth. And then notice also that he broadens the audience. He says, and to all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice with subtlety what Paul is doing here. He's saying, look, the Corinthians have written me about some problems they're having. I'm going to respond to them specifically. However, what they're going through is something that I want everybody to know the solution for. So when Paul broadens it out to those in every place who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we see that he's writing to us, right? He is writing to all the ancient churches that this letter might be passed around to and for those who come after. So we see here that the audience is really broadened to include Christians. Uh, the dates, well, these are one right after the other, A.D. 55, A.D. 56. We saw that Romans was written around the same time, A.D. 57. So Paul's letters are not organized according to chronology when they were written. They do seem to be organized more or less according to length. However, I would also argue that maybe, and this is just, this is just a guess, right? I wouldn't die for this opinion. But maybe they're also organized according to content. In other words, Romans lays out the gospel and how we should be living with one another, how we should be treating one another. Corinthians then looks at what happens when Christians don't live well with one another. There's disunity, sexual immorality, problems in the worship service. And then with Galatians, we're going to see what happens when Christians have wrong doctrine. So you could almost look at Romans as like the, the setting of the table, the litmus that we're supposed to be compared with, the proper doctrine, proper practice. First and second Corinthians, improper practice. And then Galatians, improper doctrine, right? And so these kind of maybe follow one another intentionally that way. It's a, like I said, it's just a thought. It's an idea. What is the purpose? Well, Paul wants to rebuke and admonish the Corinthian believers. Like I said, there's some problems going on, and, and some of them are very significant. And yet, even in the midst of this rebuking and admonishing, Paul still refers to them as saints. He still calls them saints. So he addresses them not as wannabe Christians or questionable Christians. He addresses them as Christians who are just not doing well. They're failing. Uh, the church is uh, undergoing some, some problems. And he also wants to answer some questions that are posed by the Corinthians. Like, in other words, we're going to see Paul say, as you wrote to me, and then he gives his response. So how many letters did Paul exchange with the Corinthians? Well, you've got this in your textbook, but I wanted to draw attention to it. So the Corinthian letters present a particular challenge since what we call 1 Corinthians may actually be Paul's second letter to them. In that case, 1 Corinthians 5.9 which may be translated, I wrote to you in my letter, may refer to an earlier letter to which the Corinthians then replied in a letter to Paul. So let's just do the math here, right? Paul writes to them, they write back to Paul, then Paul writes what we call 1 Corinthians. Okay, everybody see where we're at there? This would make 1 Corinthians the third component of a larger exchange if, as some think, 2 Corinthians 2, 3, and 7, 8 refer to a painful letter, that is different from 1 Corinthians, then 2 Corinthians becomes the fifth letter between Paul and the church at Corinth. So what do we have going on here? Within the text, we can see that there are multiple letters that have been written that we do not have. They have not been preserved. Um, maybe they were not able to be collected into Paul's letter collection. Maybe Paul himself said, we don't need that one. Uh, 
Uh, whatever reason, we can only use our imagination, but we do know the text tells us that there was multiple back and forth. And so at minimum, I think 2 Corinthians is our fifth letter. I think at minimum we can say that. So if I were to ask how many letters do we have between Paul and the Corinthians, or maybe not how many do we have, but how many do we believe were written, five would be what I'm looking for there, right? So, um, but it does also raise another question. Why were they, these not included? And once again, we can't really say for sure, but it could be that Paul or whoever organized Paul's letter collection said these two letters kind of represent Paul's answer to these problems and application of what good teaching uh, should look like uh, when it's applied to these situations. Comments or thoughts on that? If you have questions on it, there's a good chance that we just don't know the answer, but at least I can tell you that. Yeah, we don't know. Any questions or comments on that? Yes? So when you're saying the, um, that someone said these are the only two that really have application, uh, so are you saying like it's, there's a chance that it could have just been rejected from like the big local canon? I don't think necessarily there was like a formal committee that would have rejected it. Um, we don't, as far as I know, there's no evidence uh, or discussion of these other letters in the early church. So, and, and I may be wrong on this, but I, I don't think that there's any evidence that um, we have more letters to correspondence with the Corinthians than what we have with these two. So either that means Paul himself, if he's the one who kind of organized his letters early on, he thought, no, these don't need to be added or someone else who organized his letters thought that, or maybe they were just lost early on and, and that just wasn't even an option. I think those are kind of the three maybe possible answers that I would see as likely, yeah. But not a, not a big discussion early on for canonicity, right? Okay, structure and composition of 1 Corinthians. So you can see that almost half of the letter here is about the Corinthians' division uh, and their arrogance. Paul really comes in a bit heavy-handed, not quite as hot as he does in Galatians. I mean, Galatians, he's like, I cannot believe you guys have so quickly abandoned the gospel. I mean, he has really nothing kind to say about the Galatians up front anyway. Corinthians, no, he comes in and he talks to them as saints, as fellow believers, uh, but then he is pretty strong-worded. And then towards the end here, the last half, we see that he's, answering specific questions. All right, so we add the Corinthian correspondence to our mailbox here, the letter collection, and we can look at some theological emphasis. I'm not gonna talk about any literary emphases because honestly, it's very topical, the book is, so that, that's helpful in our understanding. Well, let's jump ahead to chapter three here. One of the things that Paul does is he motivates the believers to live in unity based on the fact that there will be a day that they'll stand before the Lord Jesus and be evaluated for their life. So Paul talks about believers being evaluated by God at the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, there will be some kind of reward now, I'm not sure what kind of reaction you have to the word reward. Sometimes I've, I've met Christians who have kind of like a knee-jerk reaction. They're like, rewards? Oh, that's, that's meriting something, earning something, and you know their knee pops up so quickly to their mouth they bust out half their teeth, and, and they, they just can't recover. But I, I hope we understand that to get saved, you can't do anything meritorious, right? We talked about that. Faith is non-meritorious. Jesus' work is what is meritorious, to bring us into the presence of God, to allow us to be forgiven for our sins, and to place us in Christ, all of those wonderful things. However, many of the New Testament books, and we could go back to the Old Testament if we wanted, but it's very clear in the New Testament, talk about believers, those who are already in Christ, standing before Jesus and being evaluated for the life they've lived since being saved. In other words, there will be a time where you will give an account of your life, not to pay for your sin, that's already taken care of, not to establish your standing before the Lord Jesus Christ, you are already standing before the Lord Jesus Christ, but to give an account of whether you were faithful or not in your life. And so Paul is bringing this up as a motivational tool, right, 
to get them to be obedient, to walk in unity. So look at chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. So he's talking to them, saying, hey, you're immature in your growth in Christ. He's not saying you're not saved. He's just saying you're immature. You're behaving immaturely. And if we go down to verse four, excuse me, he says, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Here's where Paul talks about the divisions. Some were saying, well, I'm a follower of Apollos. I'm a follower of Paul. Someone else was saying, I'm a follower of Jesus, kind of like the Jesus juke, right? I'll trump everybody. I'm I'm just following Jesus. I'm going to ignore Paul and Apollos. And Paul says, when you do that, you're behaving immaturely. You're just acting like little babes. So what is his solution to this problem? If you go down to verse 10, he says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. In other words, we're a team. Apollos is doing one part, I'm doing another part, but we both recognize that God is the one that is causing the field to grow. He's the one who is uh, filling the building with his presence, and he uses this building metaphor and carries it on. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one, verse 11, can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with with gold, silver, precious stones, and then notice there's a contrast here, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And then Paul goes on to say, don't you know that you, and this is a plural you, you all are the temple of God, the very presence of God. So the building that Paul is talking about is this metaphor for the church, the temple, right? So let's look at some sub points here. So in Paul's rebuke of the Corinthians partisanship, he draws attention to the individual role that each Christian has and to that individual evaluation that God will provide. (coughs) Now, I could have used the word judgment here instead of evaluation, but I think the way we normally use judgment is we think in terms of final judgment, hellfire. And so the... I'm just kind of avoiding the the connotations of that. But it really is a judgment. It's an evaluation. But it's not a judgment for sin. It's a judgment for um, based on something else. Paul uses a metaphor of a fiery furnace, which tests the value of the building materials. I'm currently in the midst of writing a paper for a presentation in November where I'm talking about the fiery, holy presence of God that's depicted in his tabernacle and temple settings in the Old and the New Testament. And it's interesting that when we talk about the seraphim or the cherubim, they're often described as fiery creatures. Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, uh, Isaiah 6, right? Even God himself is described in terms of fire. We can see this in Daniel 7 where God's throne is depicted as issuing forth uh, fire where God himself is depicted as a fiery furnace almost. And this is is not always due to his wrath. In fact, all all those passages I just mentioned, there's no wrath there at all. It's about his purity, his holiness. So God is a consuming fire. Of course, that fire is going to be presented to his enemies in judgment, but then it's going to be used to purify his people. And so I think that probably the background of this is Paul thinking about because you and I are the, the metaphorically the temple of God where we house the very presence of God. And then one day we will stand in the heavenly sanctuary, the heavenly tabernacle that uh, Hebrews talks about. Paul is talking about this idea of you and I being evaluated by this fiery presence of God depicted as a, as a furnace, really. And it purifies, it removes what is unnecessary. And so Paul says, look, in the building up of God's church, 
If you're going to build God's church with the wrong method, the wrong means, it's just going to be like wood, hay, and stubble. It's going to get burned up and blown away. If you build with the proper building materials, gold and silver and precious stones, then that means that that will remain and you will be rewarded. Now, he does comment at the end, and you may have noticed this in the reading that I just did, when he says, um, verse 15, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. So it's this idea of you and I standing in the fiery presence of God and being evaluated. And that which is impure and dross, in other words, the, the the things that we've done in our Christian life that are not done in the Spirit, I think is what Paul is talking about. We're not empowered by the Holy Spirit. Those things are just going to be removed and burned up. But the things we have done in the Spirit, as we're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, we will receive a reward. This is the right materials. So imagine, for example, um, you know, a, let's just say we have someone who is a CEO of a major corporation. And there are strategies that they use and they're building up of their company that work very well in that environment and that culture. And then they bring that model of leadership and direction to the church. And they start applying some of those methods in a church. I think Paul would say, look, there's going to be a lot of these that are not going to carry over very well because one, the church is not a corporation. Two, we don't have a CEO except for King Jesus, but not on a human level, right? And so we see here that even though things might be accomplished that way, building projects, new programs, maybe new people coming in, if it's not done according to the empowerment of the Spirit, in other words, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, all of these fruit of the Spirit, if it's not done empowered by the Spirit, then that means all of these things will be shown to be uh, worthy of being burned up. So even if they look like they're doing a good job and everything is blossoming and we're saying, look, there's real growth here, Paul says it's not the building itself that is going to promote reward. It's whether it can withstand the judgment of God's gaze, his fiery presence. Let me give you one more here and then we'll open it up for some discussion. For those believers who build upon the foundation of the gospel with wrong materials, in other words, this is your life as you're contributing to your church, your work will be burned up and you will not receive a reward. However, you'll still be saved. Now, some of the questions you might have are, what will the rewards look like? Ultimately, I don't know. I can make some guesses based on the text. I think they're pretty clear, not maybe in 1 Corinthians 3, but in other passages. Revelation 5 talks about believers ruling and reigning alongside King Jesus. The book of Hebrews talks about something very similar with rewards. Um, even Jesus tells his disciples that you will sit with me on 12 thrones. So signifying ruling and reigning under King Jesus. I think there's something to do with reward and shared trust that God has given delegation of God's future kingdom. I think those are pretty clear things, but I'm not sure I can articulate much further. Like there's not a lot of detail given. What does it mean to suffer loss? I don't know. Regret for sure that you've wasted your life, that you've spent it on selfish things, sin, not walking in the spirit to obey God, these kind of things. Of course, that's not going to be permanent. I don't believe that. There won't be regret in the kingdom. But I can't really articulate much beyond that. So I'm not sure the text gives me much detail. But thoughts or comments? Paul is motivating them to live holy and unified Christian lives based on this future evaluation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you kind of answered this, but that idea of regret and like seems like this would be a shameful thing to see like oh the things I did in my life got burned up that but that you don't think that that would be lasting
Right, yeah. I do think there will be shame because I think that that will be part of the evaluation. I mean, think of all the things that King Jesus has given us being in Christ that we've already talked about from just the book of Romans. Um, And he's entrusted these things to us and he's going to hold us accountable for them. So there will be a sense when a believer is like, yeah, I, I willfully chose to walk in sin. I willfully chose to walk my own way or I was... You know, I, I, I could have done things differently. I do think there'll be a sense of, of shame and regret there, but I don't think it'll be long-term. There will be forgiveness and restoration. And I, I think that's what Paul is talking about here when he's talking about being saved through the fire, that there will still be a welcoming into God's presence, but there will be this initial thought that, oh, things could have been different. I could have contributed more fully to what God was doing. Yeah. Good. Other thoughts? Yes. Um, the Bible, and specifically Paul in some places, talks about the, the crowns as the reward mm-hmm. um, and like different types of crowns you can get for kind of doing different things. Do you think it's possible to almost make like working for those an idol rather than just for the kingdom? Like where do we draw a line between like, oh, that would be cool to like have that specific reward here. So like I'm going to do this to kind of get that, but then obviously that's also almost like, you know, doing, performing works for God, mm-hmm. uh, but maybe not specifically for our salvation, but more like just for God himself, but so that we can get that crown. Does that make sense? I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So the question kind of is, how can that be a proper motivation if it becomes what we're looking for instead of looking for maybe loving the Lord or serving the Lord as kind of these more uh, altruistic or higher motivations? Um and I think the way that we can maybe temper that or at least avoid that as, a, as an idol is to realize that God's got a lot of uh, motivational tools in his fanny pack, you know, as he's thinking, what does this person need? What does this person need? And, you know, God is bringing out tools. Sometimes God disciplines us, right? So to get our attention. Um, and we don't want to be disciplined. So is that an idol that you're serving God so that you don't get disciplined? Well, you probably have never viewed it that way, but it does motivate you, doesn't doesn't it? Like, I'm not going to go down that road. I've been down that road 20 times, and it always hurts, and I think I'm going to learn my lesson this time. So we're not going to do that. Maybe love for the Lord is the proper motivation or the highest one, right? But I think we all recognize that our love for the Lord is, at best, it's like this, Right? And so I do love the Lord, and I want to express that publicly. I know you all do as well, right? So it's kind of an assumed uh, motivation here. But we recognize that it's not the only motivation. Uh, And I think rewards are another motivation in God's kind of fanny pack of things that he brings out. So uh, in other words, that he has a carrot that he is using to draw our attention and saying, look, faithfulness because you love me, Faithfulness, because you want to hear well done, good and faithful servant, both of those are good things um, to be shooting for. So if the reward is hearing God's voice say, Michael McKay, well done, good and faithful servant, like that's, that's what I want to hear when I stand before him. That's, that is, I cannot think of anything better than being in God's presence and having him give me the proverbial pat on the head. Like that's, that's ideal, right? And I don't think that'll ever take the place of my concern and love for him. Um, but if it ever does, there's other motivations out there that, that can balance that out. Yeah. Great question. Especially since I'm not really sure what the reward is, um, I, that even makes it a bit more fuzzy, right? So I know it's going to be good. I would rather be rewarded than not rewarded. Yeah. All right, any final thought here? Feel free to email me if you'd like to talk about this a little bit more. So here I'm kind of getting at uh, the question that was just asked. God has many different motivational tools in his toolbox for Christian growth. Being rewarded by the Lord and hearing well done, good and faithful servant are incredible motivations. So, I mean, we could put this in a real world setting. I'll pick something that's pretty pretty tame as as a temptation. You know, here you are doing your taxes and you'd like to cheat on your taxes to save yourself a bit of money or to get maybe a few extra bucks at the refund, that kind of thing. And you're wondering, why can't I do this? Nobody will ever know. It'll be between God and me and the IRS if they choose to audit me, right? Those, those three parties. Chances are you'll be able to avoid the IRS. You just don't make enough. 
between you and God. Why would you not want to do this? Well, for one, you might think it would be a sin to misrepresent myself and sin always brings death and I don't want to bring any kind of death to other people or myself and my relationship with God, so I'm not going to do it. That's a motivational tool, right? That's one reason why I do not, I try not to sin, right? It may be that you love the Lord and you're like, because I love the Lord, I'm not going to cheat on my taxes. And maybe that's the motivation that kind of brings you to doing the right thing. It may be that you are fearful of getting caught by the IRS and you're like, wow, this is going to be a disciplinary tactic that the government with God's enablement might use to get me to never do this again, right? It could be that you think in terms of, I want to be rewarded. I want to hear good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. So I'm going to choose to be obedient here. Notice how all of those thoughts, I think they're all biblical. They're all good. And and the motivations are, of our heart are very complicated. I don't think we should really delve deep into those zones. But we should know that all of these are scriptural and can be used to draw us into faithfulness towards the Lord. Okay, big letter B. I'm moving on to a new point now. One of the other issues that Paul addresses is sexual immorality. This is in chapter 5. So, big letter B, believers are to practice sexual morality. In other words, sex is to be confined to within the marriage. And just because it's needed these days, I'm defining marriage as well, biblically. One man to one woman. Maybe I should say one man to one woman at a time, just to be more precise, right? So, in other words, I'm not trying to say that Uh, those who have a spouse pass away cannot get remarried. Please don't read that into that statement. And they're not to tolerate sexual immorality amongst believers in the church. So let's unpack what's going on here in the text. So chapter 5, verse 1, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant, Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So what's going on here? Paul says there's a man in your church who is having sexual intercourse with his mom, but it's probably not his biological mom because Paul describes it as his father's wife, right? So probably a stepmom. That's probably how we should understand this. And Paul is saying, look, even the pagans... So remember, we're talking about believers in Corinth, right? Corinth is not the most conservative city. Uh, It's it's on the the cutting edge of all kinds of different things. It's wealthy in many ways. Paul is saying, look, this is something that even your own, the pagans, the people around you wouldn't even tolerate. And yet you're allowing this to go on. And my guess would be that the believers are like, look, it's, they're making some kind of allowance for this couple. Uh, Maybe they're saying, hey, look, Jesus has forgiven us for all of our sins. This is surely okay. Or I could even imagine that maybe they're saying things like, have you seen the look that he gives her? Oh, it's like pure, pure love. When they look into each other's eyes, it just oozes romance and like the love of Christ. And so they're kind of our model couple now. We've put them in charge of the young marrieds to really help them out, you know, help them to build a good marriage. I could imagine maybe the congregation is making allowances that way. Paul, you know, I could even, I mean, just using my imagination, I could even imagine them, them saying something like, well, Paul, we believe that, you know, God has destined one man for one woman and they made some mistakes in how they got there, but the point is, is that now they're here. They finally found each other, right? This is clearly God's work in their life because they're, they're happy. I'm sure we could paint all kinds of um, semi-romantic pictures of what was going on here. Whatever the reason was, the Corinthians felt like this is okay to do. This is okay to allow this. Maybe they thought it was actually promoting the grace of Jesus to allow this. But Paul comes in very clearly and he says, look, this is is not something that should be going on. Even the people around you would say, no, this is not the way it's supposed to be. He says, you need to kick this man out of the church. Now, notice how Paul words this because the language is, is a little disturbing. Look at verse three. For though absent in body, I'm present in spirit. 
and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Notice how Paul is not assuming that he's an unbeliever, but he is, a, he is saying, look, in order to save this man, not save him from his sins, but probably to save him at the judgment seat of Christ that Paul just talked about, that you need to remove him from the assembly and you need to treat him as an outsider until he repents. And then in 2 Corinthians, Paul is going to talk about how to restore such a person um, to, to the church, how they can be forgiven and how they can be brought back in. But the behavior must stop. So we can look at these chapters here, chapter 5, 6, and 7, because they talk about various issues that Paul, or various questions that Paul is answering about sexual practice in the church, um, how we're supposed to handle um, the, the, really the responsibility that a husband has to his wife and a wife has to her husband about um, satisfying their sexual needs, these kind of issues working together. How about for those who are unmarried? What's that supposed to look like? All of this is uh, pretty, pretty clear, I think, in the text that Paul is teaching us that when it comes to the biblical practice of sexual morality, it is supposed to be heterosexual, not homosexual. It is supposed to be limited to the confines of a husband and wife, right? And this is where there's a lot of freedom to practice um, sexual intercourse when it's in the confines of marriage. So I think there might be two extremes here that I've noticed in Christianity that we want to be sure to avoid. On the one extreme is the belief that sex is evil, that it's bad, that we don't talk about it. That it maybe was the original sin, that Adam and Eve had sex and then, boy, the whole world fell apart. I don't think that's even remotely close to what the Bible says, but some have taught that in the history of the church. Obviously, they had bad breakups or something. I don't know, right? They're, they're bitter about it. Uh, the other extreme is probably what we're more familiar with is that, look, my desires define what is proper sexual morality. I feel attraction towards someone and the feelings that we both have, even the physical sensations of having sex with one another are beautiful and lovely. And I'm not going to let anyone judge that. They have to be good because they feel so good. I'm loving this person, they're loving me. And whether that's a same sex or a extramarital sex or premarital sex, it doesn't matter as long as the feelings are there and they're good and they're done in love, then that means that this is okay. But notice how Paul really kind of busts through both of those doors. And he says, look, both of these are wrong. In a marriage, Sexual intercourse is good, and it should be sought after, right? And you do this for the love of your spouse. And anything outside of that is not supposed to be tolerated in the church. Those are pretty clear guidelines, I think, for how we're supposed to be living, how we're supposed to be thinking about this. So let me open this up because I don't have any sub points under this, this point, but there might be some questions out there. Yes? <clears throat> this might be a silly question, but... Why does the Bible give any whys to this? Because obviously it's very clear it says not to, mm-hmm. and that's important to follow. However, does, does Paul or even Christ give reasons as to why this is so important? So can I just ask specifically uh, what is so important? Just that marriage is confined to this relationship? Yes. Okay. Um, I think maybe things are more implied than clearly stated. Like I'm trying to think of a passage that kind of gives bulleted points. I think one of the implications is that a a husband-wife relationship is, I'll just use the word monogamous, because they're a picture of Jesus and the church. And so this idea of, even in the Old Testament, of Yahweh and Israel being married together and her unfaithfulness, worshiping other gods, you know, Her immorality was always called out like that. And now with Jesus and the church, the same metaphor is being used. And I think marriage is supposed to really point to something bigger than just that couple. So 
I'm not, I don't necessarily, I'm not confident that I can say the reason, sole reason why monogamy is biblical is because of that. But I do think that that picture is clearly established in scripture. And so um, it's very possible that a, a primary reason that marriage is supposed to be that way is also that way. Now, we, we're not, there's not gonna be marriage in heaven you know, or in the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus is clear about that. We, we will be like the angels. Um, and so we realize that marriage is not eternal in that sense. That raises a whole lot of questions. Um, I told my wife recently, I said, you know, even though we're not going to be married in heaven, we can be roommates if you want. So, we can, you know, I'm assuming that would be okay. Uh, I like being with her, right? So, uh, but how, what that's going to look like in the new heavens and new earth, I, I can't say. So I think that does kind of point a little bit to that there's a function for marriage right now. I can also maybe say there's another implication that sexual intercourse is, is extremely um, personal. It's, it's, it's something where uh, the man and the, the wife are uh, opening themselves up to one another in a way that's supposed to be sacred. Uh, the book of Hebrews talks about keeping the marriage bed pure for this very reason. And so even though we may have desires to have sex with multiple people, you know, um, we need to recognize that those desires are not coming from a sense of uh, what God wants for us, even though they may be pleasurable in and of themselves. Um, it's supposed to be at its most sacred in the, in the marriage confines. So those are two thoughts, um, if that's helpful. So if you grew up in a family where sexual intercourse was not talked about very much, you know, you're going to have to you're going to have to find some dialogue partners to help you flesh that out, right? Sorry, bad pun. To uh, to, to get more detail on that, right? Um, because it's important that Christians learn to talk about this clearly without being embarrassed, but not in a way that's provocative, right? Or um, or pornographic, of course. We want to be able to have, Christians should be the ones who are celebrating the God-given gift of sexual intercourse and marriage. But then we also want to make sure that we're on guard against what our culture is saying, and that is that my desires and the, the, the good feelings that I get from this cannot be evil or against God, and therefore they must be okay, and that logic is bad as well. So there has to be um, some real parameters here that, that God has provided. Yes. Um, so, uh, maybe an extension of that is um, in, why would incest be declared um, sin, uh, even though it was something that was around for a while? I mean, is, is it really for the sole reason of like, DNA? Like, is that your DNA? Is incest a sin? Because, no, I don't think DNA would ever be a part of it. Yeah, I don't think they were thinking in those terms at all. Um, so, I think in Leviticus, where we see these proper or maybe I should say it this way. Leviticus clearly says husband and wife relationship. Now, there's also this cultural issue where you could possibly have more than one wife, but that still apparently is made an allowance for there, even though it's not God's plan. But these other relationships, um, Moses is saying, look, this is maybe how the pagans live and all of these things are okay. This is not how you're supposed to be living. So I, I think there's more of maybe a, a helping to define what God wants sexually by explicitly contrasting it with the pagan nations as well. The people that are in the land that are practicing this kind of um, sexual intercourse that you don't, the Jewish people, the Israelites are not supposed to engage that way. More to say here, of course, it's a bigger issue than just uh, this particular bullet point that I've got. All right, so go ahead and flip in your Bibles to chapter 12 now. Paul is going to discuss the role of spiritual gifts in the church. So once again, remember, disunity is kind of one of these central things that's, that's uh, fueling some problems in the Corinthian churches. Remember, Paul ended Romans talking about unity, how to be unified when it, when it comes to particularly these disputable matters. And uh, so I, I wonder if maybe 1 Corinthians is kind of joined up to Romans to kind of pick up that thread and continue, continue to move through it. So how are we supposed to understand the spiritual gifts? Because even in the matter of the function of spiritual gifts, the Corinthian believers were, were not getting along. There were problems. There was disorder going on in the church. So if we look at uh, one of the most famous metaphors that Paul gives us, for the body of Christ is actually a body, right? The body of Christ. Uh, 
So the church, Paul uses the metaphor of a human body to demonstrate that all Christians not only have spiritual gifts, but that those gifts are all significant for the health of the church. So Paul uses many, many metaphors in his letters to talk about the church. We see that the church is the bride of Christ. We see that the church is uh, a temple. We've already talked about that actually a little bit. We see that the church is a body. And if you look at chapter 12, and let's just start in verse 4. I'll just read a few verses here. We won't read too much of this. I'll assume it's familiar to you. Chapter 12, verse 4, he says, There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there's varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. And to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And then he goes on to list some of these uh, spiritual gifts. And then if you look down at verse 12, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So Paul goes and gives a little bit more depth there. He says, is everybody in the body of Christ an eyeball? The answer is no. We need people that are ears. And then he says there are some gifts that are very visible and outward. And then there are some body parts that we keep covered out of modesty. So in other words, they're behind the scenes, maybe we could say, right? So Paul is, is, is talking about, he's using the, the imagery of a body and, and even how culturally we don't expose ourselves, right? We wear clothes. Some are more visible, less visible, but some have different functions. And he's using both of these aspects here to talk about you and I as we're serving in our local church. So it's not that it's not only that we all have a gift. You have at least one spiritual gift. But Paul says that these gifts are significant for the health of the church. And so there really is a practical outworking here for me to say, I need you to be functioning faithfully in your church for my health, my spiritual health. My spiritual health is in some way impacted by whether you all, even though we may not attend the same church, are walking in the Lord and using your gifts. So I, I realize that not all gifts have a formal, uh, you know, like someone who teaches often has a title of teacher or preacher. They don't all have a formal kind of uh, role in the church or formal function. But that's kind of secondary. That's maybe even a bit irrelevant to what Paul's talking about. The fact that we all have gifts and that the body needs the function of all of these gifts to be working in some kind of way so that we can move and open up doors and see and hear and taste as a corporate group. This is what's important here. So number two here, in the midst of Paul's discussion on the proper use of gifts, he inserts a very profound lesson on love. Now, I, I've done enough sermon, uh, excuse me, enough wedding ceremonies to know that, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 is kind of the, the pinnacle of, the, of love, right? And, and rightly so. It not only describes God's love for us, I think, but it shows the love that you and I are supposed to have to other people. All of that's great. And of course, in a marriage, that's ideal as well. There's nothing wrong with any of those applications. W- one thing you may not have noticed, though, is that Paul spends chapter 12 talking about spiritual gifts. And then chapter 13 is about love for one another. And then chapter 14 is spiritual gifts as well. In other words, it's, it's a spiritual gift sandwich where love is like the, the meat patty or whatever you want to say it here. You know, it's the, it's the, very, it's the very defining uh, characteristic of what's going on here. So the key motivation for you and I in our practice of spiritual gifts is because we, we love one another, right? We, we, I think my spiritual gift is teaching. And it just so happens that I have the function of a teacher and I get to teach in my local church as well. But all of that is supposed to be motivated and focused on the love as love for the people that I'm teaching, right? This is supposed to be what's clear here. And so Paul, in the midst of his discussion on the proper use of gifts, he inserts this discussion of love, which motivates the use of spiritual gifts. So let's just quickly go over these familiar verses. Verse 1 of chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, by the way, this is the verse where, remember we talked about earlier in Acts, glossolalia, the language of the angels. 
This is the foundation verse for that belief. But I hope you understand that Paul's, he's definitely not advocating glossolalia. And it's even doubtful whether he's even trying to affirm that humans speak glossolalia. He's just using hyperbole, I think, to say, look, even if I could speak with the grammar and the syntax and the lexical meaning of the angels, but I don't have love, it's all worthless. So, but I have not love, I'm a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and I, if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So all of this in the context of spiritual gifts. Now, Hopefully, let's just connect very quickly this to the two greatest commandments, right? Love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So part of using your gifts and being active in your local assemblies is motivated by a sense and a desire that you have to love fellow believers around you, to be a good church person, right, an active church person because of love for one another. Number three here, Paul's overriding principle is that the gifts are not self-serving, but they are body-serving. So love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is how we serve one another. And our spiritual gifts are a very practical, real world, real world excuse me, way that we can do that. Paul does say that your gifts need to be done in an organized and orderly manner. And this is really what chapter 13 is, excuse me, chapter 14 is talking about. Let's look at this text here a bit. So if you look at chapter 14, verse 1, Paul says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And then he goes on to talk about how prophecy is uh, talking, is, is like giving, a, uh, revealing a mystery to the local body, whereas tongues is is not necessarily supposed to do that. If you're going to speak in tongues, you need to have an interpreter with you, right? And if you don't have an interpreter with you or, or someone who's in gifted that way, then you shouldn't be doing it uh, in the congregation, right? And when it comes to prophecy, Paul also gives uh, some rules for how this is supposed to work out. So look at verse 26. We'll just kind of cut down to some of the practical ways that Paul orders this. Verse 26 what then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. Now, I personally don't think that the practice of tongues for today is something that is a spiritual gift. I understand that's a debated issue, and you're welcome to disagree with me. I will say that my argument is not really based on Scripture. I don't have a passage that I go to. It's based more on church history, and I've already told you guys the merits of church history. There's biblical authority, right, which kind of see it settles the deal. And then there's maybe what we can observe from church history, which is not nearly as important as the Scripture. So I think there's some wiggle room here for us to have profitable discussion, right? We can disagree with one another and not call names and that kind of stuff. She'll so be within the body of Christ. But personally, it seems to me that the early church used tongues and that that was a, a gift that God gave the early young church. But then by the second and third century, we see that tongues and prophecy were not used anymore and that other gifts became more formalized, like pastor-teacher uh, and evangelism and uh, these other gifts that, that Paul talks about as well. However, if you still do believe that tongues is valid for today, you need to understand that Paul puts limits on it, right? So if you're going to still um, hold to that view that God can still empower people to spill, speak in tongues, it should only be two or three people in the worship service at the most, right? And then verse 27, they should do it just one at a time, 
And there needs to be someone who can interpret those gifts. And verse 28, if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak privately, basically, to himself and to God. So when we see worship service going on where there's hundreds of people speaking in tongues at the same time, we need to recognize that that's not the proper practice of those gifts. That's not the way Paul has said they're supposed to function. In a worship service, there's supposed to be order. There's supposed to be clarity of message. There's supposed to be benefit and love for the whole body. And so this really puts kind of some constraints on even what we might see as the, as the modern practice of uh, speaking in tongues. Look at verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. Isn't this interesting? So it's not about people having ecstatic utterances and then kind of jumping up and saying, I've got a word from the Lord, and then talking over someone who was there, right? Or someone else yelling them down, saying, sit down, nobody asked you to speak. That kind of, like there shouldn't be this kind of argumentation, this competitive nature to speak. The spirit of the prophets is able to be controlled by the prophet. So if you've got what you think is a word from the Lord, then you take your turn. And then someone sits down and then you stand up. It's kind of interesting here. Um, If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches for they're not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came, or are you the only ones that is reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. And then the last couple verses, well, how about this? Verse 40, we'll just finish it with that. But all things should be done decently and in order. So the entire context of that, ent- of that section is about you and I doing things in order, having an orderly worship service, not confusion, not chaos, not ecstatic experiences. It's about thinking. It's about listening. It's about loving one another. These are all the characteristics that Paul has brought up. So participation in the body of Christ by the use of your spiritual gifts is not optional. This is not something where we say, well, I, I don't really know if, I'm, if God wants me to use my gifts in church. No, he does. He's given them to you so that you will use them. In fact, if I could just kind of implore you, I need you to be using your gifts. Because as you use your gifts, I'm going to benefit from them. And as I use my gifts, you're going to benefit from those. Right. So I know we're not a church context here but particularly in your local churches, right? This is where Paul is talking about that. This is how God has designed the church to grow and function and to heal. I have a couple of other thoughts that I want us to work through just very quickly, but let me open it up here because there's, a, the, there's kind of a big can that we've opened up here and, and maybe some of the worms are wriggling out. We need to talk about them. Where would you draw the line between spiritual gifts from God and kind of natural talents and qualities of personality? Yeah, that's a great question. So what's the line between spiritual gifts and maybe natural talent or ability? Um, To me, the illustration I like to go to to this is if someone is a musician, you know, there are some people that are just naturally gifted. They're able, they have that skill set and they've they've worked hard to hone that skill set. So they're just a great, you know, guitarist, pianist or whatever. Um, And I don't have any of those skills. So it's for me, I look at those things and I'm like, well, I, I wish I did have that skill set. I could, I could make use of it somewhere, right? Um, but I don't think that musical talent is a spiritual gift that Paul brings up in the scripture. But I do think that musical talent is a natural gift that a person can have that can still be empowered by the spirit to be useful for the body of Christ. So I do think that Paul is really talking about one thing, spiritual gifts, not natural gifts. But I do think that both of those, maybe as if we want to call them branches of of benefits, you know, that God's given us, both of them can be used by the Spirit to grow the body of Christ. But 
I will say this, the line is, is, gets kind of fuzzy. Like, what's the difference between someone teaching the Bible well, which clearly is a spiritual gift in the congregation, and teaching math well? That may not be a spiritual gift because it's not really relating to the scriptures, but that's not to say that that person isn't gifted in teaching. Uh, clearly, we've met good math teachers. So that's, to me, where it gets a little more fuzzy, and I'm not sure the Bible gives me a precise line I can make a distinction. Is that helpful at least? At least you know my opinion. Yeah. Good. What other thoughts? Yes. So I guess like, thinking about back to the book of Acts, we saw that there was clearly stuff that was prescriptive and descriptive. Yes. And here, like you at the end of the movie, we read it. This is the Lord's command, not putting it off. Like, I don't know. This is a new passage for me to think about. And it's kind of this thought provoking when it says, this is the Lord's command. And then at the end, do not forbid speaking in other tongues. So it was like, is there any other scripture we can go to that maybe it's, it, I, don't, I don't know, I'm just trying to, it's very thought-provoking. What's the biblical backup that it could have died off or that we are doing things wrong in not speaking? Right, yeah, th those are some good questions. Um, how about this? I think the easiest one to address, so maybe I'll, I'll pick the low-hanging fruit first, is, you know, how do we know for practicing tongues and prophecy biblically? This passage is our key text. It really is, because it says, look, you only should have a certain number do it, and they need to do it this way. And if you can't do it this way, then don't, don't do it, right? So uh, we need to look at what Paul is saying and say, okay, this, this is very clear parameters for how we should and should not practice tongues. A, a more difficult question is, uh, is there biblical evidence for gifts kind of dying off? Chapter 13, at the end, Paul says that there are going to be some gifts that will cease um, and just to kind of direct your attention to that, that's right after he talks about love, he says, um, whoops, let me get there. Uh, verse 8, love never ends, but prophecies will pass away, tongues will cease, knowledge will pass away. And he goes on to talk about when that which is perfect will come, then we will see clearly and there'll be no need for some of these gifts. Now, I personally think what Paul is talking about is the second coming. I don't think he's talking about anything before the second coming, uh, which would mean that all the gifts are still, still fair game from what Paul is saying here. And, and I think this is the best argument that people have for understanding spiritual gifts, particularly tongues and prophecy, is still valid for today. This is the best biblical argument. And I would agree with their reading of the text. I think that's true. Uh, some in our circles say that, no, the perfect is actually the formation of the biblical canon. And so because we have the word of God in print, we don't need those other gifts. But I don't think that's a good argument. I don't, Paul is not thinking in terms of canon or publication of materials. Uh, I have no evidence that he's thinking that way in any of his letters. So I don't think that which is perfect is the Bible, um, even though it would be nice if it was. It would really support my own personal views. So I think what I'm doing is I'm just looking at church history, and I'm just seeing, hey, it appears that these gifts kind of died out in the second or third century, they weren't being used. And if the gifts are motivated and given by the Holy Spirit, then that means that the Holy Spirit can take away those gifts because they're not needful anymore. And so that's really my best argument from church history. But I want you to know, you're free to disagree with me. Like that's, that's just a church history argument. I don't put a ton of weight on that. Yeah. Yes. What do we do with verses 34 and 35? Verses 34 and 35. Thank you for assuming I've got those memorized. It makes me feel good, but I don't. Oh, yeah, the women keeping silent in the church. Well, gosh, fall break is almost here. So. <laughs> We've only got a minute left. Feel free to email me on this, but let me give you a little bit of direction. It is crystal clear that when Paul says a woman needs to be silent in the church, it is cr it's just beyond even talking about, but I'm going to mention it anyway, we don't duct tape women's mouth when they walk through the threshold of the church, right? We don't do that. Nobody should do that. It's crystal clear that's the wrong interpretation because 1 Corinthians 11 says that women prophesy and they pray, and when they do it, they're supposed to have their head covered. So Paul is acknowledging that women have a role in the church in using their gifts and prayer so prophecy, what is prophecy? Well, think about that. In Theo 2, you'll have time to discuss that. But it's very clear that women are allowed to speak in the church. So there must be something else going on here that was disruptive to the service. And I think that's the framework for answering the question. 
Personally, I think the words man and woman should be translated husband and wife in this context. And I think that what Paul is saying is that when a wife has a question, don't disrupt the service. Remember, these are small little house churches. Don't disrupt the service by interrupting her husband who might be teaching or who talked to her husband. Wait till you get home and then ask your husband there. That would be a more proper way to learn. 